This morning's background reading comes from two sources. The Gospel of Luke in the 10th chapter, starting with verse 38, is our first reading. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The second reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, starting with verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. This is the reading from God's Word. So what comes to mind when you hear the word broken? Maybe it's a car that breaks down when you're hundreds of miles away from home on vacation. Or maybe it's the furnace that breaks down on the coldest day of the year, usually during the holidays. In spiritual term, the, the word brokenness often refers to a state of surrender that we find ourselves, we experience during hardships that usually come uh, during those times when things are good, but then something happens and we are broken by it. For the believers, those times of brokenness, while painful at the moment, can often be a, a way, can bring a healing effect to us as it draws us back into the presence of God. They sometimes serve as reminders that we have been far too preoccupied with our self. Sometimes brokenness comes in those moments, those moments of a heightened awareness of God's holiness and, and our sinfulness. I think about Isaiah, sixth chapter of the book that bears his name. He has this incredible vision in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphs, and each had six wings, and with two wings they covered their face, and two wings they covered their feet, and two wings they flew. And they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the sound of, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. And I cried, I am ruined. Woe is me, I am ruined. I am as good as dead. Why? Because I have lips that are unclean. And I live amongst a people who are unclean. And I, with my own eyes, have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. It's in times like these that there's an overwhelming sense of the presence of the Lord. 
And we are humbled by that. We fall broken before him. It's in those moments when Jesus meets us there in our brokenness that he gently calls us to himself. Now, as we think about the intermissions that were recorded in the final days of Jesus' life here on earth, we, we sense that he knows all about our brokenness. To be sure, Jesus was on a mission to the cross. That was the whole point of, of his life. He's on mission. But never does he ever seem to lose any sense of his surroundings, of the brokenness that he sees around him. He stops, in fact, when he hears the cries of the blind man. He stops at the tree, and he looks up the tree in Jericho and sees the most successful, the wealthiest, and yet loneliest person in that city. Today we continue our journey of these intermissions, and we continue on into the village of Bethany, a scant two miles from Jerusalem, where Jesus will meet his appointed destiny with the cross. But just as he'd done in Jericho, Jesus stops there in Bethany. He puts a pause on his mission, and it is here that he is reunited with some very, very dear, loved friends of his. There's Martha and Mary and Lazarus. You know, Jesus shares an interesting history with this trio of sisters and one brother. The Bible records three specific moments when Jesus spends time with them. We learn of these through the records that, uh, that Lazarus, we learn that through these records that Lazarus was a, indeed a cherished, beloved friend of Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. And I get this distinct impression that this is one of those close kinds of friendships that while they aren't blood relatives, they're actually closer than what family sometimes can be. They're the type of family friend that should you be passing through town, should you be passing through the town where they live and you don't stop in for a cup of coffee, or lunch, or maybe even staying overnight with them, uh, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. The first time we meet them is when Jesus and the disciples are passing through their village, and Martha welcomes Jesus and the disciples into her home. Now, this is a big deal. This is a huge deal. And Martha well, she is overwhelmed by all the work that had to be done as she played hostess to all these men. Her problem is not with the work itself, where she loves to do the work, but rather the, the, the difficulty she has is that her younger sister, Mary, is more than content to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen as he teaches. And Martha is stuck with all the work. The second time that we meet Martha and Mary is a very sad occasion. It is at the death of their brother Lazarus. John, in his gospel, sends the, spends the majority of chapter 11 describing the events of Lazarus' sickness, his death, and the raising of him from the dead. Jesus arrives at the scene there in Bethany four days after Lazarus has died. The sisters are beside themselves in grief. They are weeping dearly. They are overwhelmed by this, this difficult moment. It is in the context of this story that we find the very shortest verse in all the Bible. It just simply says two words, Jesus wept. Now, why should this be so significant to us? Well, it shows us the profound love that Jesus had for this particular family. Yes, he knew that he could and he would indeed raise Lazarus from the dead. But in that moment, his heart is captured by the depths of their love and by their, their great outpouring of sorrow. In one of the most dramatic pre-Easter moments recorded for us, 
Jesus stands at the entrance of this tomb. And he cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he does. And this is a pivotal moment in the days leading up to the final week of Jesus' life here on earth. And this event, more than any other, galvanized the great hostility that the religious leaders had towards Jesus. But at the same time, it also confirmed and it reinforced the power de powerful devotion that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus had for him. This leads us to the final meeting that Jesus would have with this wonderful family. And you'll find this account, again, in John's Gospel, Chapter 12, we're going to be reading the first 10 verses. Listen to what it says. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he indeed was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For, account, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. So once again, we meet up with this wonderful family that Jesus so dearly loves. This time it's a dinner party that is thrown in his honor. And as such, it becomes the third intermission of this journey that Jesus takes through the different villages up into Jerusalem. He is seen in that house reclining at the table with his dear friend Lazarus, no doubt catching up on the latest goings on. We can only imagine what that conversation must have been like, right? I mean, what is it that a person who was dead just a few days back, maybe a few weeks, had been dead for four days, what does a person like that have to say to the man who raised him from the dead? You can imagine what that may have been like. Martha is in her familiar place of serving the dinner guests. It is what brings her the greatest sense of joy in taking care of others. And then Mary. Mary makes her entrance carrying what was basically a translucent stone container that was in her hand. She carries that into the room. Mark describes it in his uh, in his version of the story, he describes it as an alabaster jar. Now what happens next becomes the topic of conversation, not just around that room, but later on into the village and spreads probably all the way into Jerusalem. It was an act of love that is still the subject of blogs and lessons and sermons some 2,000 years later. So Mary becomes the primary focus of this particular intermission. She has so much to be thankful for. She is indebted to Jesus and must find the right way to express her gratitude. And yet, in her brokenness before the Master, she realizes that what she is about to do will cost her everything. It will cost her dearly. It is the only way. And so the stage is set 
for the most incredible expression of love she had to offer. And so in it, in Mary, we see a love that is extravagant. It is significant that Mary carries with her this alabaster jar. Now, what separates this particular jar from the ordinary earthen clay jars that we often see of that time period? Well, what makes the difference is what it held, the contents of that alabaster jar. And it was sealed for a very special day, for a very special purpose. Young maidens often had these jars as a part of a dowry for their wedding day yet to come. And they sometimes even wore it around their neck attached to some kind of a strap. The more costly the contents, the greater the dowry. Now, Mary, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't say anything about whether Mary was indeed married. Uh, it doesn't talk about her having a husband. We get the impression that perhaps she was not but it's quite possible that this particular jar could have been given to her by her parents as used to be, to be used as part of her wedding dowry. But whatever the case is, whatever this was for, this was worth something. And Mary slips quietly into the room, trying not to draw attention to herself, but that's all going to change. She breaks the seal on the jar. Some think that maybe she broke the neck of the jar because these were a one-time use kind of thing, very expensive. And she breaks this jar and she empties the costly ointment on the body of Jesus. Specifically, John says her feet or his feet. Mark tells us in his narrative that she also poured it on his head. And that being the case, it would only be natural that the oil, the ointment, would run down off of his head through the folds of his clothing all the way down to his feet. In an act of love, she empties the entire jar of no doubt what was the most costly possession in her hands. What the text actually states is that Mary anointed the feet of Jesus with a very large quantity of expensive ointment made from pure nard. <laughs> pure nard. Now, what the heck is pure nard? I don't know that I've ever seen that at Walgreens or at Walmart. Well, here's what it is. It was an, exp an expensive, highly coveted, fragrant oil that was prepared from the roots and the stems of an aromatic herb that was found only in the region of the Himalayan mountains in India. So costly was this perfume that people used it as an investment, much like we would do with gold or any kind of precious metal or gems or jewels. They used this as an investment. Those in the room quickly tabula uh, tabulated the expense of this demonstration, and they correctly conclude that what Mary poured out in only a matter of minutes would have taken some 300 days to buy, uh, 300 days of work to buy this stuff. 300 denarii is what the text actually says. One commentator placed the value at something like $10,000, although that probably and could very well be a, on the low side. The writers make sure to note that this is pure nard. This isn't watered down. This isn't some cheap imitation. It is 100% pure nard. Comes all the way from India. So great is the quantity. So great is the quality, the intensity of this perfume that the whole room is immediately filled with its fragrance and everybody knows something special just went on. In this moment, Mary becomes Bethany's prodigal. Bethany's prodigal. Now, the word prodigal is usually associated with a parable that Jesus told, right? The prodigal son. It's the younger of two sons that a father had. He, he gave, the father gave his inheritance early on to the younger son who wanted it. And he, he leaves town, he skips out on town, and he goes and he wastes all of that money. He spends it all on wild living, right? In this sense, the word has come to mean reckless or wasteful. 
And this is certainly how many people in that room probably felt about Mary in that moment. But the word, I want you to understand something about this word prodigal. It can also mean extravagant, lavish, abundant, generous. This, you see, is how Mary saw it. This is how, in fact, Jesus saw it. Mary took the most precious thing that she possessed and she poured it all out on the Lord. She spent it all on Jesus. In a sense, we can learn from this that love really is not love if it has to be calculated. If we have to kind of figure out, okay, how much is this going to cost me? Love gives it all. Gives its all. And its only regret is that there isn't more to give. We give our all. In this moment of worship, Mary is compelled to give her all. It is a reckless love. It is an abandoned kind of love where she just gives it all. It is, a, it is something the others don't understand, though. So she loves extravagantly. Second, we see something in Mary. In Mary, we also see, that, see a love that is humble. She gives extravagantly, but she also gives in a very humble way. It is one thing to act as a warm and friendly host before your guests, but it's quite another thing to fall at their knees and to anoint, to fall down on your knees and to anoint their feet with this perfume. This is a, a, an act of total humility. While all the other guests, including her brother and her sister, watch, Mary proceeds to pour out her love in an act that borders, in a way, it borders on, the, uh, on being awkward and being an embarrassment to her. With tears running down her face, she pours out the contents of her jar, symbolically pouring out the contents of her life's devotion. She recognizes Jesus to be her Lord, to be her Savior, to be the Christ. He is the Christ, Christos, as it says in the original language. It means the anointed one. And you understand that in the ancient world, there were only a few handful of people that were anointed. Kings were anointed, prophets were anointed, priests were anointed, and the chosen one was anointed. He is the Christos, the anointed one. And if he truly is the anointed one, then she must humbly submit her life to him. And so more than a feeling that is trapped deep inside of her, she reasoned that if he truly is the Christ, if he truly is to be the anointed one, this must be reflected in an act of deepest respect to him. And just as she breaks open this alabaster jar, Mary breaks open her soul before Jesus. And this is a very humbling experience. It is a lesson she seemed to learn quicker than the chosen 12 who had spent the previous three years with Jesus along the way. In a bizarre twist, in a really strange bizarre twist, only one week later than this event, on the night that Jesus would be arrested the disciples are still arguing as to who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. In one of the very last object lessons that Jesus gives to his disciples, he gets up from the table, he takes a, a basin, he takes a towel, and he goes from disciple to disciple to disciple, and he gets down on his knees and he washes their feet, their dirty, griming feet, every one of them. And at the conclusion, he says this, If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. You, in fact, will be blessed if you serve one another. It's a humbling thing. But Jesus said, that's why we're here. The Apostle Paul certainly understood the essence of Mary's gift. Years after her act of devotion, Paul writes a letter 
to the believers, the Christians who are living in a city in Philippi. And he says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. Listen to this, friends. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. In this day and age that we live in today, in this day and age where my personal rights are viewed as the ultimate de declaration of who I am as an American citizen, Jesus calls us to put that aside, lay that aside, and humble ourselves before others as citizens of a higher kingdom. It's an important lesson that we must learn. So Mary loves Jesus extravagantly. She loves him humbly. But in Mary, we also see a love that is unconstrained, unfettered. The reaction to Mary and her act here is immediate and intense. There were those in the crowd who who immediately criticizing, criticized her for wasting an opportunity to feed the poor with that much money. A year's wages would go a really long way in taking care of the poor. At the same time, there were those who would criticize Mary for the way in which she conducted herself. And this is important. And this is an important part of the story that sometimes is overlooked. You see, Jesus, I should say Mary, wiped the feet of Jesus with what? Not a towel, but with her hair. In order to do that, in order to do that, she would have had to have let her hair down. And understand, in Jewish culture, no respectable woman would ever appear in public with her hair unbound. Never. That was a sign of an immoral woman. So hair is always up. We certainly cannot claim to know the mind of Mary, what she was thinking in this particular moment. But we do know that in the ancient world, a woman's hair was considered her glory. It was her glory. And in this moment of unconstrained love, she laid down her own glory at the feet of Jesus. In this moment, as she poured out her heart and soul to Jesus, she really didn't care what everyone else was thinking. Didn't matter. Her own glory became a towel of service to dry the feet of her Savior. She did not hear the gasps in the crowd. She did not hear them muttering. All she knew was in that moment, in that unconstrained moment, she was wiping the feet of her master, her Lord, with her own glory. And she didn't care about them. Blocking everything else, her only goal was to honor Jesus. In this particular intermission, Jesus stopped long enough in Bethany to allow Mary the opportunity to do what perhaps she had been thinking about and planning for many days. In, in the face of criticism, Jesus blesses the actions of Mary and gives to her, gives to her the gift of his approval. I can only imagine the sense of joy she must have received when she heard the words of Jesus as he spoke to those who were in the room. Leave her alone. Just leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. This story is going to last, friends. 
What is our takeaway? What do we take away from this moment? Here's what I'm seeing is may we, may we be found to have a love like Mary. She demonstrated her, her love through, through a visual act of anointing his body. She did something. It wasn't something that she felt in her heart. I've got the joy of the Lord in my heart. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got all this stuff down in my heart. No, she did something. She put those feelings into actions. She loved Jesus extravagantly. She didn't hold back anything. She loved him humbly. She loved him unconstrained. She didn't care what everyone else might be thinking in that moment. In the same way, we are called to love Jesus that way. To love him extravagantly. To love him humbly. To love him in unconstrained matter. And as we do so, let me under, help you to understand something. As she is anointing the body of Jesus, understand we too are called to anoint the body of Jesus. And you do understand that the body of Jesus now is, is visually seen in the church. For the body of Christ is the church. And as we do so, we will honor Christ in his mission. So what are we talking about with a next step? What is the next step for us? Let me just give you one today. This week, what I want you to do is identify a very specific way in which you can serve the body of Christ. I want you to look at how you can do something extravagantly for the body of Christ. Something that you can do that involves great humility. That's not going to go, hey, look at me, look what I'm doing. No, it's done with great humility. But it's also something that is, is done without any constraints. No constraints. We don't care what anybody else may think. This is what I feel compelled to do for the body of Christ, for what the Lord has done for me. So, this is the challenge before us. To love like Mary. Let's pray together. Oh well, Lord, we give thanks to you for this story. Thank you for the great, the great lengths that Mary went to show her love for Jesus. And may we embrace the story in our lives so that we may love extravagantly, so that we may love humbly, so that we may love in such a way that is unconstrained, unfettered. God, I pray that our love for you would just continue to grow and, and flourish. May we be broken as we find ourselves in your presence, but at the same time, may we be welcomed in and may we be drawn in close to you. Help us, Father, this week to love like Mary. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.